from there and this entire discourse about the desecration of religious monuments, what was the motive behind that desecration and was it the desecration only under the Hindu-Muslim paradigm, what would you have to say? Well there again you see the point is that one doesn't deny that there was a desecration of monuments but if you look at it historically um, it's really quite interesting one has to ask the question why everywhere in the world with every civilization and every advanced culture, there are desecrations of religious monuments. And the answer is one, that there is a religious antagonism or a wish to take over a particular place. Uh, two, that there is something political to be gained by this. And three, uh, that there may be a financial gain. Now in the Indian situation it is a very complex story and simply to say that you know the, the Muslims came in and destroyed temples, this is a, a, such a crude oversimplification that one can hardly bear to sort of listen to it. Uh, the complication is this, that if you look at the location of Buddhist monuments, they're always impinging on the earlier megalithic sites, burial sites. The megalithic. The megalithic burial sites. There are you know, many cases, uh, not invariably every case, but in many cases it's quite marked. They're either impinging on or they're adjoining. Now, why do they choose to build their particular monuments so close to an existing monument? Is it because they are asserting that this was a sacred site and therefore we are taking over the sacredness of this site, which could be one argument? Or is it to assert that we are a much more powerful religion and we are replacing the earlier religion, which is an equally feasible argument. Then you have, once Buddhism is established, you have uh, the Hindus coming along and converting Buddhist halls of worship into temples. With the Shankaracharya and much earlier, much earlier, much earlier, places like Ter and Shezarla. Um, where the, the Chaitya Hall of the Buddhists, which is this beautiful hall with sculpture and the votive stupa at one end, um, is happily converted into the mandapa of a Hindu temple. Uh, this happens in frequently, many, many cases one can, when one can spot it. Or you have a very overt antagonism. It's extremely interesting one hasn't been through the texts with a tooth comb, but this needs to be done. Uh, Kalhana, writing in the 12th century, a Brahman from Kashmir, who wrote the history of Kashmir in his very famous book, the Raja Taranjani, he talks about how uh, rulers in Kashmir attack the Buddhist monasteries in Gandhar. Gandhar was the region, the borderland between what is today Pakistan and Afghanistan. They attack the monasteries, they kill the monks. And this is there in Kalhana's Rajatarangani. This is written in Kalhana's Rajatarangani. That in, in the, the period when this happens is roughly uh, the period when uh, the Hunas are in power, Mehirakula and Toramana and so on. So it would be about the sort of fifth, sixth centuries AD. Hmm? Uh, so you have that going on. Now it's not on a huge scale. But it's there and one has to come to terms with the question of why is it there. Uh, then you have, all right, yes, the, the Muslim, the Turks and the Afghans come in and start destroying temples. Uh, they didn't destroy as many as is popularly thought. Uh, the popular opinion is that they destroyed 3,008. Whereas uh, Richard Eaton, who has done a meticulous study of every reference to the destruction of a temple, has said that you can only account for 80 temples having been destroyed. Only 80. Only 80, as compared to this other figure. Now, the question, of course, is um, why? Uh, again, you're back to say what is very interesting is that uh, the temples that are destroyed are not the small, strongly religious ones. It's always the big temple, the wealthy temple, 
the temple that is, uh, you know, politically important and economically important. They're targeted. Uh, so one has to say that there are three elements that go into this temple destruction. One is the religious element. We don't like this religion. They're worshipping images. It's against Islam, so we will destroy their images. And what is interesting, again, is that the Somnath temple, for example, Mahmud destroys the idol. He desecrates the temple, but he doesn't totally destroy the temple, as, it, as is generally believed. And then, of course, it was uh, reconstructed later on. And before Mahmud destroyed it, it had been destroyed several times? No. By other kings? No. no. Um, all right, so one is the religious element. Hmm? The second is that if it is a temple with a large treasury, then clearly it's loot. And this is true of uh, every temple that is destroyed. There is usually, it, the choice of the temple is usually one that has a treasury, so that you get something out of it. Uh, Mahmud is interesting because he destroys Hindu temples, rich Hindu temples. He also destroys mosques that are run by the Shias. And the chronicles have this sort of repeated refrain, he killed 50,000 kafirs and he killed 50,000 Shias. It's regular. Uh, so one doesn't know whether, you know, you don't believe the figure and then you say, where, where, it's, it's religious animosity, uh, animosity at a certain level. So there's that, there's the financial thing. And the third thing that we must remember is that the temple, the rich temple, the temple that is associated with the capital city and is patronized by the rulers is a statement of power. Yeah. It's only when the ruler becomes truly important, politically important, that he builds his royal temple and declares that he has become politically important. So the attack on the temple is also an attack on political power. Now this is common not just to India, but it's common the world over, that financial inputs, religious animosity, and the uh, attack on political authority are three reasons why religious monuments are attacked. But again, Kalharna has a very interesting description in the Rajatarangani, where he mentions that over a period of about two centuries in Kashmir, there was a series of kings, Hindu kings, who attacked Hindu temples and looted Hindu temples. Uh, and one begins to wonder, as you're reading, as I was reading the text, I began to think, you know, how can this be possible? Why are they attacking Hindu temples? Then you come to the reign of the very famous king Harshadeva, uh, who is not only looting temples, he's desecrating temples, his officers, and he appoints a special category of officers known as the officers for the uprooting of the gods. That's the definition. That's the definition. Deva Utpananayaka. Now, you have to ask yourself the question that here it's not religious antagonism. Here it is pure and simple loot. And, and Kalhana says that. He has a very interesting analysis of this and says that there was a fiscal crisis and the only place from which wealth could be obtained in a hurry and easily was by looting temples. And he does this. So my point about this is really that we shouldn't rush to give one reason to explain this. It is a very complex story. It touches on many levels of both individual and social behavior. Um, and there are many examples of people preserving temples, and there are other examples of people conserving temples uh, who are not Hindus. There are other examples of Hindus defending mosques and so on. It's very much a case of what is the local politics, what is the local financial situation, what is the local religious feeling that determines this.